together as we worship the Lord together. Good morning and welcome to worship. It's great to see you here. If you've joined us online or live in the Peachtree Room, it's my privilege to welcome you to worship. And if you're a guest with us, we especially thank you for joining us. In fact, if you're with us here in the Peachtree Room, we'd love for you to fill out one of the connection cards located in the seat in front of you. We would love to drop you a note and thank you for being our guest and hear a little bit more about your life story. And if you've joined us online, we would encourage you to text the word welcome to the number on the screen. And we'd also like to drop you a note and stay in touch. And thank you for being our guests on this day for worship. We've made a commitment to continue to pray for each other throughout this year. Thank you for sharing your prayer concerns. And if you have updates or additional concerns, you can jot those down, give them to a staff member following the service, or text the word pray to the number on the screen. And we'd look forward to... Uh, keeping up with you and praying for the concerns in your life. Now, I'm just glad we're all here this morning. Yesterday, about the time the animals were gathering in our yard two by two, I was thinking we would arrive on campus in boats today, but the forecast has improved. We have many more families joining us online this morning, and it'll be a great experience of worship. So as we prepare to worship the Lord on this Sunday morning, uh, be prepared to join with John. We welcome John Duncan back as our guest worship leader today and next Sunday. It's so good to have John with us. Sing along with John as he leads us this morning. Andrew will be sharing the children's message just a little later, and we'll be sharing a few words of encouragement. We are glad you're here. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is indeed a wonderful privilege to be here with you today as uh, we had opportunity to come back to this area of the state because we're getting ready to start music camp next week in which uh, we work with quite a few children and high school students. Uh, and so you'll be in prayer for that, that God would do a mighty work among our, our kids and our campers and our faculty members. But it is a wonderful thing also to be blessed with Brock here playing the piano. And uh, we appreciate the prelude inspired me, Brock. Thank you so much for the good work that you do. 
And we have a, a guest also on the drum set. This is um, Dennis Durrett Smith. And we're so glad to have Dennis with us. He is a friend from many, many years. And I know a friend to Eddie as well. Aren't you glad for the faithfulness of musicians like this that want to give their best that we might be able to worship him? But that faithfulness does not come because of who we are. The faithfulness is something that is instilled in us through the faithfulness of a heavenly father who loves us. And on this Father's Day, let us celebrate the faithfulness of our heavenly father. You remain seated as we sing the first stanza. I'll have you stand in just a moment.
an exciting day for many of us. We've already been out on the porch and I brought a little sack with me that has a bee and out on our porch we were already celebrating our fathers. We had Father's Day breakfast for some of our families that chose to come and we were honoring our dads at breakfast this morning. Well it made me start thinking a little bit about my father and maybe you've given your dad a nice gift and a card already. I know our boys and girls did. But you know, today is Father's Day, and it's a day when we say to our dads, or we think about our dads, and remember about him, and we are thankful for him. And I want you to think about all those things that he does for each day. Well, I was thinking about my dad, and I'm thankful for him, and I have so many wonderful memories of him. So I brought with me a B sack in my bag here, and it's all things that start with the letter B that reminds me about my da dad. So my first one is some bread about how my dad always made sure that we had bread on our table. He worked hard. He worked at Texas Instruments, and then he'd also go out at night and referee games till late at night. And so sometimes we didn't always get to see him because he was making sure that we had breads and bicycles at our series. My next B are my ballet slippers, my little ballet slippers. You see, when I was little, I danced a whole lot, and it seemed like I had ballet class and all my dance classes late at night, and my dad would sit out in the parking lot in the car waiting, it seems like I'm sure he would think forever for me to come out from my ballet class. And he would sit out there and be very patient with me, but he always took time to help me. Not only that, when I would get home and I wanted to practice my dance, my dad was an audience for me to be able to practice. He took time to show me and do special things with me. Sometimes, dads, it's real easy for us to get busy, but it's important for us to take the time with our children to do important things. I'm so glad I had a dad who did that. Next, 
my B is my braces. And I brought my little braces case that I had to have for a long time. You see, I had to wear braces for over three years because my teeth were so messed up. And my dad would take off work every month and drive to pick me up at school and drive me to the orthodontist and wait on me to get my teeth fixed because it took a long time. And I'm so thankful that my dad made that commitment every month to help me get my teeth straight. But my last B is my Bible that I have here in my sack. And I brought that because I wanted to remind us as dads and to remind my dad and tell him how thankful I am about how he would always make sure when he picked me up from dance class and it would have been a long night that he would say to me, hey, do you um, know that about God that he um, sent his son Jesus to die on the cross? I just want to make sure that you know about that. And he would talk to me almost every time he would pick me up to make sure that I knew about God's love. And, you know, I think about how important that is that my dad was willing to pick me up, but he also shared with me that important truth about God's love. So, boys and girls, I have a verse to share with you today, and it's John 3, 16, and it says, For the, this is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And, you know, my dad made sure when he would pick me up from dance class and we would drive home, and he had talked to me about God's love to make sure that I knew that I could become a Christian. So, dads, this morning, I hope this is a reminder to you some of these B things to provide for your family's needs. I'm sure you are, but to take time and play to make your child feel loved. And most of all, that you dads are encouraging your child in the Lord and, and how much God loves them. Let's talk to God together. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for our earthly fathers. Help us this day to show our love and appreciation to our fathers. And may we always remember to show our love for you, our Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Well, boys and girls, kindergarten through fifth grade, you're um, invited to dismiss with me to go to children's worship, and our Youth Student Connect will be right out this door as well, right now as we sing. As the children depart, let's sing together thy word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid and I think I've lost my way, still. Pray with me this morning. <clears throat> Father, as we come celebrating this Father's Day, some of us are grandfathers too, and we celebrate that, that we've been blessed with good grandkids that you have given to us to be an encouragement to. But Father, we also come with an anxious heart today that <clears throat> as fathers and as protectors of our home, we are anxious for what's happening in on the streets and the byways and the stores and the drive-by shootings and the evil that is existing in our city, in our state, in our country. Father, you said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And, though, and the blessings will come to you when you protect us. Father, we... Find today on your word that 
we're looking for rest and refreshing in our life because of the disheartment that we see sometimes with the evil that exists. Father, you said in your word in Psalm 91, verse 9, it says, If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is our refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels to con concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Father, we also look to for Psalm 91 and verse 15. It says, Love the, uh, the Lord because the God is speaking to us through that word. And you said in Matthew that we're to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind and love our neighbor as ourselves. And we pray for those people, Lord, our policemen, our defenders, our first offenders, uh, first responders. We just pray for them, Lord, that we can support them and encourage them. But you also said in the verse 14, through 16 of Psalm 91. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Help us, Lord, to let this sink in today about your grace and your protection and your mercy of how you stand with us and how you walk with us with that nail-scarred hand, that we can walk with the power that you have if you've overcome death, that you've healed the sick, that you've parted the Red Sea, all the things that you've done in the miracles of your life that you've shown to us, that we know the power that you have to protect us and watch over us. So we thank you, Lord, for this day. And we pray this in the strong name of the Lord Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. And all God's children said, Amen. A reading from Genesis. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable, suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the space with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. The word of the Lord, and we give thanks. Whenever I think about my father, who's now in heaven with the Lord, I think about a couple of things. First is uniform, as a drill sergeant in the army. Maybe that's why I get my bossy attitude, I'm not sure. But he was actually a kind and gentle man. But the other thing I remember about him was that every night, without fail, I always remember him in his recliner towards the end of the evening with the Bible open. He would read through the Bible every year and he'd keep the word in front of him at all times made an indelible impression on me that the Word of God is important to our home. And I'm thankful for a father that kept that in front of his children. Thy Word, it is a lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. Let's sing together. And 
Let's stand together now. What do you do when you discover that your family isn't perfect? Now, there are those who still think their family is without flaw, but they either live in a world of grave naivety or intentional dishonesty. When you read scripture, 
Even the passage that Olivia read for us this morning from Genesis 2, which is the inauguration of family where we see the creation of man and woman and you follow the story through not long after they are charged with cleaving to one another, we find they have children and the children are at war and before long they're asking, am I my brother's keeper? And you know the rest of the story that lends, ends so abruptly and so tragically. For some of us, when you say family, it puts a gleam in our eye. And we remember family life, despite its imperfection, with the utmost joy and nostalgia. But for others, when you say the word family, it opens an ancient wound and you bleed emotionally and sometimes spiritually because the scar tissue of the past has not yet fully healed. And the same is true of God's family as it is of every family. Just like our nuclear families, God's family is not perfect. And even the family we call church family that are so meaningful to us as we learn to love each other and share God's grace, we do that in light of our own human imperfection. But I've got to tell you on this Father's Day, as we say Happy Father's Day to all the father figures, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, adoptive fathers, foster fathers, and everyone who has a fathering role in life. We're also mindful that this particular gathering, we're but seedlings of a family God is going to grow here through the ministries of this church in the years ahead. And as we continue the process of regathering following this year of pandemic, we want to continue to be faithful and flexible and realize that the rootedness of those of us gathered will continue to grow and spread. And if this group is any indication God is going to be growing a multi-generational, weather-resistant spiritual family here. So thank you for your faithfulness. It was years ago, I was at a young minister at one of the early pastor's conferences, and I had heard of Dr. Jess Moody, not knowing I would ever meet him. Longtime pastor at First Baptist, West Palm Beach, Florida, later moved to First Baptist, Van Nuys, California, and a friend of Bill Self, if I recall correctly. And Jess was preaching not long after going to, to uh, Van Nuys, and someone said, Jess, big difference in Florida and California. What is California like? And he said, it's like a big giant bowl of granola, fruits, nuts, and flakes. <laughs> well, a few years ago, after my first retirement from pastoral ministry, and I entered practicing as a pastoral counselor in a clinic, I was assigned a family I didn't know, and they came and wanted to talk to me about the family dysfunction. And I said, well, tell me what your family's like. And the husband immediately said, we're like a giant bowl of granola, at which I said together with fruits, nuts, and flakes. And they said, how did you know? Well, for all of us who've done family some way or the other, we recognize the imperfection of the human family. But we also know that we're called to honor God by doing our best to enrich and strengthen our family relationships despite our imperfections. One devotional writer I was reading recently said, families are like fudge, mostly sweet with a few nuts. Well, that describes my family as well. As a pastor through the years, when people would have grave difficulty, maybe problems with their children, maybe their lives were on the brink of divorce, maybe dealing with the utmost tragedy, they would come to my office and say, we got family problems, but you're the pastor, we're sure you know nothing about family problems. And I finally was tired of hearing that, and I said, I can almost dare you to name one problem that my family hasn't faced through the years. We are an encyclopedia of family dysfunction. So whether your family looks like a traditional nuclear family group or a group of loving, caring individuals who are family to each other, family life can be chaotic and messy and must be held together by the cords of grace and perseverance. 
Maybe you're here this morning and you believe you have the greatest family in the world and you only want it to get better. But maybe you're here this morning and you think you have the most dysfunctional family in the world and only God can make it better. There may be someone who his life has been reconfigured or maybe it's still in that process where you're navigating a whole new part of the journey. Or maybe your confession is because of the absence of other family. You need church family more than you've ever needed church family in your life. I've been thinking about this text along with many other texts that speak to family. And there are some very uh, brash things that I wish somebody had told me when I was a teenager when I had all of these romantic and idealistic notions about family life. And the first is this, imperfect families are the norm. As a kid growing up in a fairly dysfunctional home with loving parents that got married way too young as teenagers, I wondered if everybody's family life was as hellacious as our family life. And I thought we were the odd family out and every other family bordered near perfection. And not only did I begin to discover among my friends that their families had the same kind of dysfunction and chaos at home, but I began to look for that model family in Scripture, and it's just not there. The Bible gives us all kinds of stories of exemplary conduct on behalf of churches and missional groups and citizens. But when it comes to family, there's not a perfect family from Genesis to Revelation. There's Adam and Eve, but they had this problem with the serpent. There's Abraham and Sarah, but they struggled with their own uh, 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 barrenness. And then they had a fidelity problem. There was Isaac and Rebekah, but one manipulated the other around the birthright issue of their children. There was Jacob and Leah, but they struggled immensely after Rachel's death. There was David and Bathsheba, and the list goes on of all of David's other life partners. And yet they struggled with the scar tissue of their affair for the remainder of David's reign. There's Hosea and Gomer, which is a story unto itself that would have been an R-rated movie, and they had problems over the nature of Gomer's work outside the home. Then you turn over to the New Testament, and there's Ananias and Sapphira, but neither could pass a lie detector test. You see, it just goes on and on and on, the dysfunction, and those are the people who God loved. Those are the people who God redeemed. Those are the individuals and the families that became trophies of God's grace. And so I remember as a 15-year-old thinking, if God can use those families, God can even act with grace within my family. George Bernard Shaw had a line that I love. He said, if you can't get rid of the family skeleton, you might as well make it dance. <laughs> and some of us need to be about the business of helping the skeletons of the past dance in our family lives. The second thing that comes to me from these texts is that when we're in God's family, we're called to do family life God's way. One of the greatest areas of conflict is that we want to be children of God, saved by grace, followers of Jesus, but then we want to follow all the popular culture trends of the world in doing family, and the two just don't mesh. Your family life and my family life is a subsidiary of God's family. Family is the original small group, and it's always been multi-generational. That's the reason church family is most healthy, when it's multi-generational. For the purpose of family is to teach and mentor children on how to live life God's way. And the job of the church becomes to reinforce and supplement what you're already teaching and doing in the home, leading children to follow Jesus. And as Angie said so beautifully, to appreciate the message of Scripture, the gift of salvation, and the blessing of forgiveness. Henry Ward Beecher in one of his books said, you know, 
the most important thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. And we don't have time to get into the problem of, as David Gushy from Mercer says, the biggest moral problem in our country is the decline of faithful, monogamous, covenant partnership. That the missing ingredient of two parents in the home, blessings on the single parents who make it work. But the love of God is most visibly expressed in imperfect human family. There are a lot of things that help us get family on the right track, and it really helps us to keep it there. To participate in church or spiritual community faithfully and regularly. To manage our finances wisely and according to God's plan for stewardship to reconcile differences quickly and teach our children the futility of holding grudges, to encourage each other consistent. But we're growing in our faith as we become more consistent in the way that we navigate life by following in the footsteps of Jesus. You live life differently when you know you're in God's family and you do family life differently when you model it after God's family. And when all else fails and family comes unglued, as it did for me numerous times, you keep reminding yourself that you're a child of God and a part of a family that will never, ever break up. When you're sure you're a member of God's family, you will always look at your family and your family responsibilities differently and more faithfully. Third, is to remember that conflict in our families, well, that's an opportunity to demonstrate God's grace. Among many other things, family is a laboratory for grace. And we win some and we lose some. Don't ever get discouraged that you've messed up along the way and haven't done family perfectly and just say, I'm ready to call it quits. Because we're a part of an imperfect human family, we are learning as we go. I would love to tell you that you just read scripture and it's the manual for perfect parenting. Actually, scripture is a manual reminding us of God's grace and our call to perseverance and endurance because God knows in advance none of us are going to do it perfectly. Every family has conflict, some more than others. By the way, I'm in the process of doing uh, preparation for a wedding coming up in October. I'm at the age where I'm doing these second and third generation weddings and they're fun, but I received a call from a young lady now living in Fairhope Her grandmother was my um, administrative assistant at my second church. When she was born, she came to the office and would sit in my lap. I did her parents' wedding. Her sister or her mother was my sister's best friend in high school. I've known them all my life. And she said, I want you to do my wedding. And so I require three pre-wedding counseling meetings. So I began to work through the material. And we're at the very front end of that. But one of the things we talk about is the faith dynamic, the communication factor, and conflict management. Now, years ago, couples would come in and say, but we don't have any conflict. Then we start talking about honesty. (laughs) You see, the question in a relationship is not whether you're going to have conflict, it's when you have conflict. And if you don't have conflict management skills, family life will quickly go down the drain. It's true in the workplace, it's true in the church, and it's true in the home. Our lives aren't devoid of conflict. God gives us the coaching, the mentoring, the guidance for dealing with conflict. When it comes to family life, what do you do when everyone's not on the same page? What if there's a holdout in someone being willing to forgive? To the best of our ability, we have to keep doing the right thing 
even when others in the same family do the wrong thing. You see, conflict is a laboratory in experiencing and applying grace. And it's like sunscreen. At the bottom of every tube of grace, there ought to be a phrase that says, apply generously. And in family life, it's important that we're generous with grace. Well, finally, family and church family are called to stick together through all the seasons of life. One of John Killinger's best-selling books, John, a retired minister, theologian, was at Vanderbilt for years, was Christ and the Seasons of Marriage. Mitch Albom, the popular writer, says sticking with your family is what makes it family. By the way, I could say the same about church family. One of the things that happens in church life is when the going gets tough, the pastures look greener just down the road. When the truth of the matter is, in church life, we are not competitors with our other churches. We are colleagues. It's like a big bank where we're each a branch of the same mother institution. And if you go down the road, what you discover is the dysfunction in the neighboring church family is just as real as the conflict and dysfunction in your church family. You just don't see it from the outside in, but you don't have to be there for long till you see it from the inside out. And it's important for church family to stick together, especially during the tough times, so that the seedlings can grow and you can nurture and cultivate and prepare for God's future. And the same is true in our nuclear families, that there are times that individuals must part ways. I remember hearing a pastor preach in a revival, there is no room for divorce. Well, my Sunday school teacher growing up, her husband was an alcoholic that wouldn't get help, and she refused to leave him. And one night he came out and got a gun and started shooting at her, and there were bullet holes in the wall. And our pastor went by to see her and said, Judy, you've got to leave. She said, but God says there's no room for divorce. And he said, you haven't read the text right. It was time for her to leave. Her life and her children's lives were being threatened. And some of us have lived through that kind of chaos and dysfunction. But some of us want to bail on family at the first sign of a rough patch. Well, I tell couples about to get married, there are a lot of rough patches out there. But there are a lot of fertile fields and advent faithful and demonstrate perseverance. I was driving down the road just a little over a year ago, just before coming to Atlanta, and I don't pay a lot of attention to cars. I haven't driven a lot of new cars. We've always kept used cars, and I don't like getting them scratched up, but I saw a car ahead of me, and the right rear view mirror was very stable. The one on the driver's side I was worried about, it was flopping around like it was going to come off and head straight for my windshield, but it stayed on the car. And I thought maybe a screw was loose, and so I pulled up at the next red light. And when I pulled up, I couldn't believe my eyes, but the, the rearview mirror on the driver's side was attached with duct tape. Do you know how many things you can use duct tape for? And the thing was, this wasn't the new duct tape, this multicolored. This was old duct tape that had been there for a few years. And I suspect that when the rearview mirror side past the driver's side started to come off, he reattached it with some of the most cohesive stuff in the world. Not very attractive. Wasn't the same color of the car, but it had stick to itiveness. And I imagine if I found that car, that mirror still there with duct tape. You know, there were a lot of problems in the family I grew up in, but my father kept duct taping us back together. And this Thanksgiving, we'll have a family reunion for the 61st year in a row because we stuck together despite the imperfection. Family and church family are called to stick together through all the seasons of life.
If you wait on your family to become a perfect family, you're going to be waiting for a long time till you get to heaven, actually. But if you follow God's guidance, my imperfect family and your imperfect family can teach us valuable lessons about God's grace. So hang in there with your family. There are some valuable lessons we can learn from them. And this morning, here's the good news. Whether you're married or single, younger, older, prodigy or prodigal, know that God wants to adopt you into God's family. And that's the best family of all. A place where you find your ultimate sense of belonging. A place where you experience God's unconditional love. And if you want to know more about what we mean when we say child of God and follower of Jesus, we'd love to help you get started on that journey. And we'd love to be your conversation partner and your encourager. If you're here in the Peace Tree Room, be welcome to visit the information table in the foyer following the service. Or if you're watching online, call the number on the screen and leave your name and number and we'll get back with you immediately following today's service to talk with you about your faith journey. But in the meantime, our families with all their mixture of function and dysfunction, with all of their joy and their frustration, are really a gift from God. Let's treasure that gift and maximize it this side of heaven. John's going to come and lead us as we sing the following words of commitment, committing ourselves and all that we are and all that we possess to be faithful followers of Jesus. Let's stand and sing these words together. It's always great when the family of God can gather together in this place, and this morning is no exception there. What a wonderful time of worship together, and I'm so glad that you are here with us today. And if this was your first time to join us, we hope that you'll 
uh, feel free and welcome to come and worship with us again in the future. And if you're worshiping with us online, we are glad that you worshiped with us there as well. So uh, just, uh, just plan to worship with us again next time at this same time. You know, there's uh, things that are going on in our church family this week that are important, and I want to share a few of those things with you, some uh, highlights and reminders for special events that are coming up. Um, parents, take note of the fact that uh, Wednesday Night Live continues this Wednesday. Uh, the special theme nights will include fun and games and Bible study from 6 until 7 p.m., and will be an in-person event on the play porch. Now, this is for kids who are entering uh, kindergarten through sixth grade in the next school year. So be sure to email Angie uh, to reserve your place. Josh Spate is going to be leading a summer Bible study this Wednesday evening uh, from 6 until 7. The study is from the book of James, and it's called Being Right in a wrong world, uh, you'll need to RSVP to Pam Jernigan if you plan to attend. All students in grades 6 through 12 are encouraged to attend Youth Win every Wednesday from 6 uh, to 7 p.m. And you'll need to contact Victoria to register for that. Uh, next Sunday, there will be a lunch bunch pool party. Uh, and it event uh, starts immediately after church and goes until 4 p.m. Transportation will be provided for this. And you'll need to RSVP to Angie Durden if your child will attend. As always, we thank you for your faithfulness and your giving to support the ministries of uh, Wyuka. We do all of this to the glory of God so that we might reach people and grow people in their faith. And uh, through events like what we've just shared just now. Uh, as you know, you can uh, drop your offering in the baskets that's here on the stage or at the front uh, as you go that way. Uh, you can text the uh, word GIVE to the number that's on the screen, or you can give online at yuka.org, or you can use your own bank's uh, uh, bill pay system. Uh, however you want to do that, uh, we're grateful for your uh, generosity and for your giving. In just a few moments, John is going to come and lead us in our closing song today. But first, Pastor Barry is going to come and share a blessing for the week to come. Let us stand for our become grandparents of a new set of twins. So we say congratulations and welcome back to the service today. It's great to see so many of you here. These are exciting days to be a part of the church family at Wayuka. If you're new to the community or new to the Wayuka experience, I'll be in the foyer. Would love to have an opportunity to meet and greet you following the service today. After we share a blessing, John will lead us in singing our final chorus, singing as we go. May we pray together. Lord, we are so grateful for all the individuals in life who've been like fathers to us. And we especially give you thanks for choosing to be our Heavenly Father. Now send us from these moments of worship to live as your children, to be examples of followers of Jesus, faithful, friendly, flexible, and forgiven. And we pray our prayers in Jesus' name, amen. We have heard the word of the Lord and it guides us as we go. Let's sing together. Thy word is a lamp and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a 